We can get started. Uh, welcome to Deliberate Practice and Practice. Uh, this is an experience report. I'm talking about some of the things that I've done at work. Um, and uh, just make sure you're in the right session, Deliberate Practice and Practice. OK. Um, so this is my bio page. Uh, these are my daughters up in the top left corner. And they drew a banana to look like me. Uh, this is my son catching his first fish uh, with our brother-in-law and my father-in-law. And I'm not a triplet. But sometimes, I don't know if you as testers kind of feel like maybe to your spouses, we may feel like we're in duplicate or triplicate where we kind of are critical of things. We ask a lot of questions. So I just thank my wife for having the patience to deal with me. So uh, that's what that picture is for there. So I've been testing for about 12 years. And um, 12 years might not be that long. It kind of depends on the experience itself. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about that uh, throughout the presentation too. Um, and I like going to user groups, and I especially like coming to conferences, and thank you all for coming today. This is kind of showing me like the kinds of people that come to conferences and want to learn more and improve the craft. Uh, and if you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter. I don't post a lot, but I like to watch and follow some of the other uh, expert performers of testers uh, online. Uh, and I'm wearing this lab coat basically because uh, I won this at a Star West 2013 conference because they had this lab set up where you could go and actually perform testing for them. And it was run by uh, Bart and uh, Bram. So they were from, I believe, Sweden or Finland. But they talked about uh, winning a prize if you could perform this testing and find some of the best bugs. And so I went and I was going to try to find some of the best bugs. I ended up playing this video game. And I wasn't really finding a ton of bugs, but I was asking a ton of questions. And so they felt that it was pretty valuable, the questions that I was asking. And so that's kind of what put me in this mindset of, Testers need to figure out the right questions to ask and get those, those questions figured out. And then those are the ways that we find those most important bugs. Um, so I found a few small problems. And then at the end of the conference, they were talking about giving away these lab coats. And I didn't think I had any shot in the world. So I was just kind of walking around looking at the vendors and going to different uh, sessions. And then Bart and Bram, they came and found me and said, hey, Dwayne, we, we want to give you this jacket. I said, well, why? Well, it's, it's signed by James Bach, Michael Bolton, Lee Copeland, um, and some of the other uh, testers that were there. And so I just kind of took it home and thought I was proud of it and uh, left it in the jacket or the closet. But uh, I wanted to bring it today because these are some of the experiments that I've actually done at work. And I wanted to kind of bring the experimentation lab code out. So I brought it here today. Um, then this is just kind of a reference for uh, helping you understand where I'm going with the talk. So you've got that context of these are the main points. Uh, also helps me remember that uh, I should stay on time too. But uh, expertise level. All right, this is where anyone who wants to walk out now, you're free to do so based on my expertise level. So we're going to start with speaker. I kind of graded myself here. This isn't good or bad. This isn't going to say, like, he's a three. He's the worst talker ever. Let's get out now while we still can. This is saying, like, wouldn't it be interesting if all the talks at the conference were like, this speaker's a one, this speaker's a five, this speaker's a 10? It would be interesting to see, but uh, this is just kind of like how I'm grading myself. I've done a few presentations. I've done online test conf by Joel Moth-Leski. I've done a few uh, contests, and I've applied at CAS. I haven't been accepted there yet, but uh, I'm trying to improve my uh, speaker presentation skills. And that's why there's a sticky note in front of each of you. So uh, if you could give a one through five of your rating of how the talk went at the end of the talk, uh, or if you're done now, you can just throw one on there and get out. But <laughs> at the end of the talk, please uh, give me some meaningful feedback. Give me a one through five rating. And then if you have some other constructive criticism, I'd appreciate it too. So like, went too fast, went too slow, exercises weren't helpful, content was useless, whatever you want to do. Uh, and so at 100 Contacts, that's where I work, I, uh, I'm kind of a boss, manager, coach, and mentor. Uh, and on that, I've kind of rated myself around a four uh, because I've only been a manager for about six years. Uh, and I'm trying to improve uh, areas in that as well. So I'm, I'm kind of doing this as my gauge meter. And then as a software tester, where 10 is kind of like these super performer experts that you see, I think I'm kind of in a five. I'm trying to grow my skill sets there too. So it might be helpful for you to kind of see where do you think you're at now and what are the skills that you want to improve. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get into some more actual examples. Does anyone know who this is? Mozart. Mozart. All right, and he was well known for music. And what was the name or the, the title that they kind of gave him for that? That was, was kind of a prodigy. 
like a child prodigy. So um, about 10 to 20 years ago, prodigy was like natural born talent. And it's now been changed to uh, a child prodigy is someone who has adult-like talent and has performed that well uh, at around 10 years of age or younger. Um, but before it was like they were born with this natural talent. And what I'm here to tell you right now is there isn't a natural talent that you're born with. There's not this limit of how well you can do. You're way more capable of what you think you can do. And so the gift that Mozart had was this gift of adaptability. And he had a father who taught him how to be adaptable, how to teach him all these different instruments, how to have perfect pitch. Uh, is a talent that you can even learn today if you wanted to, uh, though it's easier to learn when you're younger, but you can still learn it today. Um, and so before we get into more deliberate practice, I wanted to talk about practice itself. And here's the Oxford Dictionary of it where we're trying to repeat and put in repetitions, but we're also trying to improve in our activity or skill uh, to maintain our, our, our proficiency in it. Um, but I think what some people think when they think of practice is more of this naive practice. And it's where you're just like, I'm just gonna keep going and trying and doing it, repeat, repeat, repeat. I've practiced it a million times. And I'm kind of guilty of this as, too, uh, of this as well. Uh, when I was in high school, I was doing band. I did drums, I did marching band, I did jazz band. Um, but when it came to actually practicing for those things, I was really just kind of like, here's the song, put it up on the tray, play through it, get all the drum sets done. And then that was it. I practiced maybe that thing two or three times. I wasn't really looking at the places where I was struggling. I would do that in a few instances, but I was horrible when it came to solos and I couldn't practice those to save my life. Um, but how many of you practice walking today? Like you, you all, oh, somebody practiced walking. Okay, no, you all walked to the conference, I'm assuming, unless someone's in a wheelchair, I'm not gonna be accessible, uh, racist or anything. Um, but what I'm saying is like, when you practice walking, you're, you're kind of walking, and naive practices, yeah, I just walk. It's automatic. It's this habit that you have kind of built in your brain. You know how to walk. And um, if we're actually practicing walking and we're trying to maintain our proficiency or get better at it, we would look at maybe our stride and see how well we're walking or how straight are our feet in terms of uh, being parallel to some kind of form of curb or sidewalk, uh, checking out our stride length, like are we heel toe and I mean, that's, that's kind of like where we're looking at what practice and, and getting more purposeful, purposeful or deliberate about our practice. So looking at purposeful practice, we need to set some well-defined specific goals. And what that means is it's not, uh, like I said with the drum example, I'm not just gonna practice drums by playing better. It's saying when it comes to the snare drum and how I'm using my hands, I need to make sure that uh, the paradiddle is a technique that some people uh, use for training is a left, right, left, 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 right, right, left, right, right. And so you've got to practice that and have a skill set of, or a, def a defined goal of how well you want to do that. So it could be, I want to do something within a certain time limit, uh, but you want to make sure that they're very specific and really fine grained on how you're tracking that performance. Uh, it could be think thought of as a metric, but, uh, and we'll look at some more examples later. Um, and purposeful practice is focused, and we wanna get super focused. So you wanna be able to get rid of any distractions, get rid of the ability to be distracted in itself. You don't wanna have any applications running, you don't want uh, emails coming in bothering you. If you, can, if you can try to avoid people coming in bothering you while you're doing practice, that is also helpful. Uh, if you have a hard time with people coming and bothering you a lot, you might wanna say, well, let's go book a conference room and then just sit down for 25 minutes, and that's the focused amount of time and we're gonna go and we're gonna practice this uh, specific thing that we're looking to improve. Uh, and purposeful practice takes getting out of your comfort zone. And uh, with deliberate practice, it's more about a specific amount of getting out of your comfort zone. Like speaking at a conference could be out of your comfort zone. Uh, sometimes it is for me as well. Uh, and it just takes training and some, some practice to get through. Uh, and then getting feedback. Feedback is really super important on what, a, what is it that you're doing and having someone else watch you and saying, yes, you're doing it right, but here's some other areas where you can improve or you're doing this piece really well, but you could improve in this small uh, set and that will improve your performance of the skill that you're trying to practice uh, as, as you go along. Um, so feedback is super important and uh, I've got a, a good example of this as well. Um, so when we talk about true deliberate practice, it's the same as uh, purposeful practice, but 
Uh, when we talk about the out of your comfort zone, you want to be just outside of your current capability. So there was a study done with a gentleman named Steve Falloon in uh, 1977, uh, and this is from Eric Anderson's book, Peak, where uh, Steve Falloon was trying to remember numbers longer than seven digits long. He would be given a number uh, in uh, one digit sequences per second, so it'd be like one, five, four, three, six, seven, two, and he would have to say that back to uh, Eric Anderson to uh, try and improve his memory. So when it came to just outside of his capabilities, they would say, okay, if you can memorize seven numbers and you've got that down, let's work with eight. Can you do eight? Okay, you can do eight, now go to nine. Now, if you fail at nine, you come back down to seven and you try seven again, you try eight, you try nine. If you nail nine, then you go up to 10. And so they were just trying to stay really tightly inside of his capabilities, and that's where they started with uh, getting out of his comfort zone and trying to improve, but not at such a drastic pace. At purposeful practice, you can actually try and go way out of your comfort zone and like jump in the ocean if you've never been in the water before, but it's not gonna be as helpful as like maybe starting with a wading pool or moving on with a smaller, just outside of your comfort zone. Um, and mental models are extremely important in terms of deliberate practice. We've got to improve how we're mentally visualizing what we're going to do, these mental representations of what it looks like to perform a certain task, as well as uh, diagrams and models that we can draw that are improving the way we think about our applications. Uh, a good teacher or coach is needed for this, uh, for deliberate practice, because it's got to be someone who is considered an expert performer and has designed these tools and techniques to help you improve your performance in ways that they've done before. And they might even look at ways that you're improving and update and design those techniques to be even better than they have. Um, and this is the one that gets me a lot, is like the field of study needs to be well-developed. And by well-developed, it means like centuries of time. So currently, the only true deliberate practice uh, performances out there currently are chess, uh, violin and other musical performances, some athletes such as ballet and uh, gymnastics. Uh, these are the kind of the fields that are well known to be areas where there's tons of techniques and mental representations that these coaches can give you and make you improve from basically nothing all the way into a world athlete, Olympic star, uh, professional performer on a world class level. Uh, and the reason that I have a hard time with it is because with the world of technology, it changes. So if I want to do true deliberate practice and I want it to be these techniques that have grown over centuries of time, I, I can't do that because five years from now, it's going to be the new thing. Five years ago, it was like AI and 10 years before that, it was web services and so architecture and all these other things. So our technology is constantly changing. So I'm still trying to aim for deliberate practice, but I know that it's not going to be ever accomplished in its truest sense. Uh, okay, so for my experience report, uh, where I'm kind of coming from is my goal is how do I influence people to become the best software testers at the company, at the United States, at the world? What, kind of, what are the things that I need to do to train them and the techniques I need to use to make them become true test experts? Uh, and so we have swarms, and these are kind of our model of how we look at like uh, the Spotify team model or uh, a DevOps team. These are uh, teams that have everything that they need to be uh, to do the releases that they need to do and have everything that they need. So we have uh, a tester or two on each swarm. We have uh, a few devs, we have a UX designer, we have a product owner, and all these people sit co-located in one team environment and they're able to swarmify on any feature or function that they need to get done and get it out within an hour or a day or within a few days. We're doing multiple releases a day uh, across over the same, some, of, some of the same websites. So we're looking out for interactions between my feature going out and another website team going out at the exact same time or really close to. Um, we have automation where it's needed, and by that I mean we have a bunch of protractor tests that we write to kind of cover our website, but we don't have excessive amount. We don't uh, require that protractor automation to be for every single feature that goes out. We look at what's going to provide the most value. And we're look, using the accelerate metrics per swarm. So we're looking at things like mean time to recovery, our frequency of releasing, our um, failure rates, and we're also looking at one other one. I always forget the last one. But we, we look at those accelerate metrics on a weekly basis and see where are the places that we can improve. We use the retros to kind of identify 
our release count's kind of trending down right now. So what are the things that we can do to kind of up that up? Are our stories too big? Or are we introducing more bugs? And that's why we're doing some more rework. So we look at rework as well. Um, so experiment number one was how do I make work more visible? So I had a team member that was doing automation. He was writing these protractor tests, but some of the work that he was doing for that automation wasn't being viewed on our JIRA boards. It wasn't being viewed as a task that he was doing. So it was kind of like that blank time. What are you doing all day long if I have this feature for you to test and it takes you all day instead of uh, an hour or two? And it, it really came down to working with the team to say, how do we value the automation and, and how do we show that we're, we have that value as a team? And so we were putting those cards now on JIRA and I was providing feedback on the work that he was doing as well. So every time this person would do automation, he would submit a pull request to the system. I would look at those pull requests and I would give feedback based on uh, content of the automation, uh, whether the automation was needed or not to review to make sure that we're not adding unnecessary automation. Are we uh, deleting the old stuff that may have been uh, written over or are we getting rid of tests that no longer provide value uh, as well as um, setting some goals around his work. So telling him like, hey, I noticed that we've done this automation piece here on this feature where uh, this part of the website has a button and you're able to click it now. Do we need to make sure that this button is always visible? Is it something that should be hidden at some point? Is it supposed to be unavailable? What about multiple clicking? So those are the kind of uh, exercises that we would go through to say, uh, what are the goals of the automation and what are we, how are we going to do it well? Uh, with experiment number two, it was trying to provide feedback in a faster manner. So I had seven testers that reported directly to me, but they were all spread out across these different swarms. So I was having a hard time, A, spending a lot of time with them to help coach them and help improve some of the performance of the testing that they were doing. But I also had a hard time understanding where their work was. I could go look at the JIRA board, but it wasn't giving me a lot of info in terms of what they were doing. So uh, I was able to write some automation with a Agile coach, and we now have a Slack integration where every time someone, or one of my testers does some work, I get a notification on Slack that says, hey, tester A went and finished this story. Do you wanna go and review the feedback? And so I go on, I look on, and I see, what browsers were you using when you did the testing? Uh, if it's the automation, go through the pull request. If it's not the automation, uh, what are the scenarios you went through? Uh, and so that gives me a good way to get have that conversation with them or at least even reply just in Slack. Hey, I didn't see any comments on this card of what browsers and what mobile devices you use. Could you go through and just add those notes? Because I, I really cared about what kind of notes that we were doing uh, because I come from uh, an older style of uh, doing note taking and I'll sort of show that in just a second here. So these are some of the notes that I was taking. This is a this is a key management service, which is a service we no longer use. But uh, back in 2014, these are the kinds of charters and sessions that we were creating to do the testing and also do the note taking, which I felt was one of the most important skills that we could build on. So on this, let me see if I can scroll down. Ah. But what you can see here is that we uh, were creating these XMI mind maps uh, with the coverage model of San Francisco, San Francisco Depot, which is a heuristic for looking at coverage. And we would create mind maps that looked like this. So uh, another tester and I created this model. And so this is kind of like my mental representation of how this service looked. So it was a service that would basically just give you a key and that key would be used for like an order number or customer ID and that would be passed to the other systems. So I needed to know what, how does this application actually look? And so this is a model that uh, I've found very helpful in my experience to show me things that I need to look at. So in terms of structure, like what is it made out of? What are the, is it, what technologies does it depend on? Where's the data at? Where is it logging? So this is kind of something I can also share with the rest of the team because I can say, hey, I have this model and it says that the data should all be here. And then a, a dev could say, well, you're missing three tables that we also have used and I had no idea. Um, I generally like to look at the code and the configuration files to see where all this data lives, but there could be places that I'm missing something or maybe I, my assumption on what we are using is incorrect. And so this kind of gives us a way to talk about it. It gives me a good talking point and something to point at and say, does this look right to the rest of the team? And maybe the designer has a question or the product owner has a question and we can go through that and say, 
yeah, we haven't done a lot of coverage of that piece. Do you want us to perform more testing in that area? Um, so that is one of those examples, but um, with our DevOps teams, it's kind of harder to do the note taking as diligently as we were before. So focusing on speed and releasing and having high quality, we're now just adding comments into JIRA and then reviewing those as a team when needed or just as a manager and, and a tester. Um, and I think there's still some improvements we can do there, but that's just one of those areas where having a deliberate mindset about the work that you're completing and then the skills that you want to improve. So note taking in this case is the skill and trying to make that uh, those notes a lot better. Uh, experiment number three was tracking a skill to develop capability. So I wanted to learn more about Protractor because that's the automation tool that we're using for our Angular application. And I was looking at these pull requests and some of them I didn't understand well enough. So I figured I needed to become capable at learning Protractor enough so that I could give better feedback. So what I did was, uh, and, and this is based off of the first 20 hours. This is a, there's a, a book and a uh, TED talk called The First 20 Hours. Um, and it kind of teaches you ways to develop skills in 20 hours so such that you're capable. You're not an expert, but it helps you improve your performance significantly uh, in just 20 hours uh, and being really intentional and deliberate about how you're doing it. So this is my example here. This is my protractor automation. This is a Trello board, but you could do it with LeanPub, LeanKit, uh, or not LeanPub, LeanKit, or uh, Kanban Flow, or you could even set up a Jira board for it. Um, and so I ask a lot of questions such as, I mean, is this a lovable problem or project is like number one? Like, is this something I really wanna do? Because if it's not, and I just drop it after five hours, then maybe it shouldn't have been something I really wanted to put this much uh, focus and time on. So I ask these questions on the left and I'll be giving these slides out uh, after the talk as well. And then I also look at separating out into at least 20 hours worth of tasks. And you might see these uh, tomatoes over here so this is using an integration tool called Pomelo, and Pomelo does uh, Pomodoro timing, so it does 25 minutes of focused work on uh, at tracking your time. So uh, here you can see I've, I had modeling and thinking, and I put some notes in there for what I needed to model about protractor automation and what I need to think about in terms of being really good at uh, protractor automation. So I put notes in there, and then I did two focus sessions where I'm doing some research, I'm creating some models, and then I'm just able to add that to the Trello board and then have it all organized and, and a way to kind of track. So here you can see I did uh, two Pomodoros on this one task that's two, about two hours. It's really uh, 50 minutes with 10 minute breaks. Uh, but I found it really helpful in terms of my experience to learn more about how to develop skills and how to show this to my team as well. So I can t tell these testers, what's the skill that you really wanna learn and let's go through some of these important questions. And then also let's set a target performance level. And I've got an example on the next slide here of what a target performance level is. So I wrote down, I need to be able to create my own tests, run them locally, and then be able to submit them to cross-browser testing and be able to get these to run through our CD, CI CD pipeline at appropriate times. So I felt that after 20 hours, I should be capable enough to reach this target performance level. And so if you have something that you can set as a specific goal, so here I've got some, I don't have a specific timeline in mind. I thought that, you know, 20 hours I could do in a couple weeks. And, uh, but I did write down like, what are the things that I need to perform to be really good at this skill at the time, at the end of the 20 hours? And then even if I wasn't, how long do I think it would take to get to that point? Is it another set of 20 hours or is it only five to 10 hours? Um, but this is kind of helps track how well I'm doing and am I trying to reach that goal? Uh, so I found that pretty helpful. Uh, and now it's time for a group experiment. I think that's just one kind of a small experiment you could do with either your team or with yourselves at the very least and say, let's go home and try this out. I, in any application you pull out, you could pull out Amazon and try some of these input value tests yourself and then kind of train yourself to memorize what inputs you should try given an input. Uh, and then train yourself on different types of inputs, whether they're uh, number inputs or string inputs and, and look at the differences that you would do in those cases and ways to find out that information about what kind of input it is. Um, so for some of the successes that I've had doing some of these aiming for deliberate practice, um, our quality has gone up and that's shown by really not having as many severe issues in production. So we're not having as many, we call them SEVs, uh, where 
uh, anytime we impact a customer in terms of experience or order placement or uh, uh, they call in with certain issues, we'll write up these SEVs and try to investigate what's happening and try to resolve those more efficiently. Uh, we still have third-party interaction problems. We still have uh, places where performance isn't as perfect as it should be. So we still have SEVs, but they're not related to simple bugs that got into production. Uh, and so I've also learned a lot about how to teach some of these testing skills. I've given uh, some presentations at work and ways to kind of help the team do better on uh, learning their skills, but also ways that I can teach it better and ways that I can be more informative and provide efficiency there, uh, as well as trying to update my own mental models. So I have models of what I view an uh, expert tester should look like, and I'm trying to update that and try to also reflect like, how do I do some mini steps from the testers I have and try to improve their performance efficiently so that they can also be experts. Um, and then I think it's also helpful that your organization kind of helps you become or have that ability and have the mindset to help you grow. And if that's not possible, then uh, try to either spread the influence or see if there's a better opportunity. Uh, I think that having a company that supports learning in an environment where we have to constantly learn. That is like the tester's job. The tester's job has always been about learning about the product, learning about the customer, learning about how to find issues, learning about how to solve problems. Uh, so I, I felt that that's been really helpful and successful. Uh, and we also have this model that is we champion you. So for every manager, they are supposed to champion the people that report directly to them. And that means that you care about their career and you care about how they're being developed and care about growing them as a person and, and caring about them individually. So uh, that I think is also helpful. Uh, and some, some of these pitfalls. So one thing I noticed is that I'm really the only one that's giving a lot of the feedback because I'm the one that has the most experience at the company in terms of testing. So it's not the worst thing in the world, but I would prefer if I could kind of grow a culture where each tester can coach each other. And that way it's not reliant on just one person. I feel like I'm kind of a single point of failure in that role. Uh, so that would be something that if I were starting over again, I would try to figure out a ways to grow that culture first before being the only guy that's doing it. Um, and I feel like we're still doing purposeful practice and not as much at deliberate practice. And so I'm trying to improve the ways that we're doing that. Uh, and like I said before, it's not, the technology hasn't been around long enough to actually make this where the techniques are there for you to just go and look up and figure out how to do on your own easily. And there's not a ton of coaches that can actually give you this feedback that well. Um, there are a few expert performers in the industry that will let you do Skype sessions with them and, and help the, they'll coach you through some simple problems that you're having or skill sets you want to develop and so you can find uh, them. And that uh, I also feel like feedback is needed from the community and I also want to say thank you all for coming today. I think that this uh, is very important in terms of growing the community of testers and having testers that come to conferences and learn about these kinds of things and grow our skill sets, our mental models and our techniques. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and then some future experiments. I want to I want to create my own application that uh, is probably more specific to 1-800-CONTACTS that have specific bugs in them, and then have the testers practice going through that a few times and seeing how they grow from that experience, and then adapting these applications, kind of similar to the Testing Challenges website. That site is awesome. There's a bunch of different challenges on there you should try when either you're on Better Network or if the site's performing better. Um, but also, figuring out ways to identify the very specific skill sets and goals that I need to train the testers on so that they can grow. And it's, it's really hard to kind of measure skill performance because a lot of it is just thought. I can't tell, I can't see what you're thinking. It's not as easy as going to the gym and exercising and seeing some muscle growth or development there. I, I can't see what people are thinking. So uh, getting that feedback is kind of hard. So I, I need to do some more experimentation around uh, looking at those skills. And I used to have a music teacher that always used to say, it's not practice that makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. Uh, so that's one of those things that uh, actually through practice I've learned a lot that I need to figure out ways to make my techniques a lot better and closer to perfect. And then uh, I need to have my skills broken down. I have some skill sets that I've broken down a little bit, but not really well. So I'd like to get better exercises and better techniques and better skills that are way broken down into smaller subsets and that are easier to measure. Uh, and then I also want some more community and industry involvement where, uh, like all of you coming here today and giving me feedback, I think, think that's going to be really helpful for my learning as well as ways that we can approach the subject with 
all the different communities that exist. You've got Ministry of Testing, and we've got um, uh, Modern Testing, Online Test Conf, we've got Contests. There's all these different communities that come up that we could be sharing a lot of these skills and techniques better than we have been in the past. And so I'm trying to look at ways to do that. And uh, here are the books that I've read that I felt gave me the best idea of how to start with getting better at practice. Uh, and again, the first 20 hours, there's a, a TED talk that uh, Josh Kaufman does really well. Uh, so I recommend that. Um, but Peak is the book about uh, looking at any skill and figuring out how to work in a more deliberate mindset. And then I think that is all I have for the presentation. And thanks for coming.